So, hello everybody, my name is Mason Clark. I'm a mechanical engineering student here at Cap Poly from Milner, graduating uh, this semester. So, I'm gonna, um, this has been a two year project, um, this design, and I'm gonna go through my, some of my history, um, history of the device, um, I'll go through the project and everything else. So, um, here we go. So, uh, quick overview of the presentation. So, I'm gonna talk about background and history. Um, purpose of the project, obviously every project should have a purpose of some sort. Uh, design requirements, uh, what was required of the design, all the design requirements were set forth by myself um, because the product, this will ultimately become a product that has to be marketable. Uh, so for, um, then I'll go over design um, uh, specifics about some of the parts, how they were designed, some of the more technical stuff. Uh, I'll go over the manufacturing overview of how the car was manufactured and how it will be manufactured in a production line setting. I will go over, finally, uh, the test results of the vehicle, and hopefully we can watch a short video um, demonstrating my preliminary test that I did. Okay, so the purpose of this project was to design a safe uh, rail vehicle that is hand-powered that goes on standard railroad tracks that could be propelled by four people. Uh, and uh, the project, I currently have it outside the atrium. If you haven't seen it yet, it's out there. It'll be out there a little bit longer after the presentation. And you can see the prototype. After the prototype is tested fully this summer, it will go into production, hopefully, as long as there's no other design um, modifications necessary, in which a second prototype will be built. We hope to uh, be manufacturing this product under Kalamazoo Manufacturing, LLC which is in the process of being formed at the moment, and that will be the, co uh, the company that will manufacture these vehicles. Okay, so my background. So where did I get into this? So I started in 2012 at age 13. I built my first hand car, that's me on it, and that's uh, copied from an original design. Uh, most of you have seen this type of hand car in TV shows. Um, there's been thousands of them produced over the years, and obviously they're obsolete today, but they are very fun vehicles to operate. Uh, the problem is they are not terribly safe, and for an amusement park setting, like what my product is designed for, they will just not work. So that's why I'm developing my new design. So I started Calvin's Manufacturing in 2016, where I've been manufacturing these standard hand cars I export around the world. I am the only manufacturer of these hand cars in the world. This hand car got exported to France last year, and um, there is um, there's a lot there. There's demand all over the world for these, so I'm trying to keep up with it. <laughs> so the history of the hand car. So uh, the walking beam hand car, which is what you see here, was designed around 1880s, and it was used extensively up until let's just say 1920s, when the internal combustion engine took over. Thousands of these hand cars were produced. They were all over the world. And without these, uh, railroad tracks could not have been maintained the way they have been. Um, so the internal combustion engine took over, and this is the result of a motorized hand car, essentially. So nowadays, they are just around in museums and for nostalgic purposes. Uh, quick note, the uh, Sheffield Car Company, the largest hand car manufacturer in the world, uh, had a dedicated engineering building. And to this day, that is the only building that has survived in the complex in Three Rivers, Michigan. And these engineers work to continuously improve the design. Uh, that picture is inside the original factory showing the hand cars being manufactured. Okay, so let's dive into the project itself, this, the project that I'm currently working on. Uh, so what's the purpose? That's the question I get. Why have I dumped $5,000 into this prototype and two years of my life? Um, so the purpose of this project is to design a new vehicle, a new hand-powered vehicle that is safe to operate, enjoyable to operate, and has a market in today's economy. So uh, let's draw some attention to other operations. So in New York, we have a rail bike business um, that started several years ago, and they are their business is booming. They're, they have, they, they have, they, they cannot fill the capacity. They have so many people, their capacity is filled all the time. And what they're using on these pedal bikes, they're essentially just bicycles mounted on the tracks. And they are not the most efficient devices. They weigh in over 700 pounds. 
Uh, my vehicle weighs under 400 pounds. So there's definitely a benefit in the weight um, savings. Uh, Korea, it started in Korea, and um, it's a big thing in Korea, and it's now spreading to France and all other parts of the world. And as you see, these are all just regular bicycle type vehicles. They are lever vehicles like mine. Okay, so design requirements of my vehicle. So I set forth these requirements. Uh, allow, obviously, the um, efficient transmission of power has to be efficient. Mechanism free of a dead zone. So every crank mechanism has a dead zone, top and bottom dead center, where torque is equal to zero. I eliminated that, and I'll, I'll describe that later. Bidirectional, so the car can go in either direction without being turned. Safe for the riders, robust in construction, and manufacturable within reasonable budget and resources. So we can't have this thing costing $100,000 to build, which it could if, if you don't design it right. So design overview, I'm going to quickly go over um, some SOLIDWORKS drawings and photos just showing various parts. Um, so mechanism allows propulsion using the feet and the arms. So about 75% your, your arms, 25% um, your feet. And that, that is proven to show to be the most efficient transfer of power from the human body to a crank mechanism. 3.41 to 1 gear ratio, um, proven from 100 years of testing that the original hand car manufacturers did to be the best. And I've tried other gear ratios and did not have as much success, so those engineers did so they knew what they were doing when it came to gear ratios on these things. So, um, adjustable seats and seat belts, aluminum frame bolted together. So, some consideration went into do I make this an aluminum frame or do I make this a steel frame? So, from deflection analysis and stress analysis and many other factors, corrosion, I settled on aluminum frame. All bolted together. There was no structural welds on the, on the car. All the, the only welds are, are spacers um, that are used to keep the, the thin wall tubing from compressing under under load from those bolts. Uh, the gears, I'm going to draw some attention to the gears. The gears are all custom made, uh, ductile cast iron. I went through the whole manufacturing process, uh, 3D printing a, a pattern, casting them, machining them, popping the teeth. Um, so they're all made custom with a light profile to reduce inertia effects and reduce overall weight on the vehicle. This, um, this lever arm here is the main lever arm, main driving force of the vehicle. It has been machined from a solid block of aluminum and it's been designed to uh, bias uh, torsional and bending stresses induced um, on it from the riders. So let's draw attention to perhaps the most important aspect of this vehicle and that is the mechanism. The uh, drive mechanism um, has been attempted for a hundred years to be adapted in such a way that there is no dead zone. So, this is the first implementation of a successful no dead zone mechanism on a hand car. And how it works is the crankshafts are 90 degrees apart. The crankshaft is 90 degrees from this crankshaft. And two identical mechanisms on each side. And these and uh, is driven through a single drive um, shaft. So as long as there's two riders, there is always power stroke. And the, the graph up here shows that at um, any angle, that the, um, the torque will always be greater than zero. And at 45 degrees, when both arms are at 45 degrees, you have maximum torque because it's a summation of the two torque graphs from both mechanisms. So uh, we did, uh, I did some fine element analysis on the structure. Uh, deflection analysis shows that the maximum deflection is 18 thousandths towards the center. And the original frame was tweaked um, because we had, I had before the section cut out and the deflection was very high, so I, instead of cutting it out, I, I brought it together and that spread the stresses out over the top and the bottom part of the structure, really improving the rigidity of it. So the gears that I mentioned, they're custom made. That's the foundry pattern that was put on an automatic casting machine at uh, Lodi um, Ironworks in Lodi, California, where they casted the, the blanks machined and hopped. The, the, the um, quick calculation up there demonstrates the force on the teeth and um, it shows that, that the teeth are in fact experiencing very low stress considering um, and they are very large. So they're definitely, we're not going to break any teeth off. The wheels, the wheels are um, uh, consist of a wood center um, around a steel tire. And the steel tire was custom formed around a die 
and the wood centers are manufactured and pressed in. And the wood allows dampening, it reduces the inertia effect um, compared to an all steel wheel, and it reduces vibration, which is a big deal on something like this. It makes the ride more comfortable. A uh, quick, quick aerodynamic uh, CFD simulation shows that the drag coefficient to be 1.7. It was tested at various degrees um, because from experience, wind has a big factor on hand-powered vehicles. I have once um, had to push the car because riding it was too difficult due to wind. So it's always, aerodynamics is always kind of on the back burner, something to consider. Um, so we'll see it from field testing, you know, how the aerodynamics play it out. Uh, some sample calculations, the only thing I'm going to go over, the crankshaft was, is the highest stress part on the, on the car, with a factor of safety around 1.5. Uh, I increased the factor of safety to 2 by increasing the diameter of the shaft by only 30 thousandths of an inch, and I was able to increase the fatigue life of, of the shaft, so just some um, simple cal calculations there. Uh, and then manufacturing them. So quickly about the manufacturing process. So this was all manufactured in my garage with my equipment. Uh, I did contract some stuff out. Um, this big arm here was machined on a, a mill. The length of this room, a 127 ton machine, CNC machined. Castings were done on campus in our very own Cal Poly Pomona foundry. <coughs> the aluminum castings. And some castings were done on, on my driveway. <laughs> uh, Here's a picture of the frame being, you know, seen assembly. As you can see, it's aluminum all bolted together. Uh, gear blades getting machined, wheels on their axles after, and uh, you can see the bearings there. The bearings are angular contact, mixture of angular contact, radial ball bearing, and spherical roller bearings, all to bias thrust loads where necessary. So, uh, finally, testing. So, several months ago when the car was about 75% done, I did a field test on it to test the mechanism. And the mechanism performed very well. So um, from there, then I was, I knew it was a successful device. And, and after that, I, 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 I finished the frame. So the, um, I have a quick video, if I could pull it up. We had some technical difficulties here. And this video is showing the testing of the beat, so you can see how it works. So I'm going about seven miles an hour here. I'm propelling, I'm the only one propelling this. You can see how easy it is. For four people, you can imagine it should be theoretically four times easier. All the bearings are ball bearings or, and roller bearings, very little friction. So, um, in conclusion, this has been uh, my life for seven years, and this project has been my life for two years, on top of being a full-time student here. So, you can imagine how important this is to me, and I hope in the coming years that this will morph into a successful business. So, if you have any questions, you know, we're probably out of time. You're welcome to ask questions now or come down and yes. see me. We'll open yes. to the question. I just have one question about this uh, wonderful design you have. Do you need any patent protection, or do you, if you're the only manufacturer, maybe you're not worried about somebody stealing it from you. Uh, yes, I thought about trying to pat patent the device, which I think I could, um, but there, at, at the moment, I don't see, I don't see anyone really stealing the design. Well, I think they would have a hard time stealing it. And <laughs> 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 um, 
So, I, I mean, the Koreans are manufacturing these rail bikes, as I mentioned, and the rail bikes are, are um, much simpler to make, so you could just go buy bicycle or motorcycle parts and put it together, but I, I yes, I, that's a good question. I have thought of that, and I am slightly concerned. At the moment, I am, I'm not publishing this all over the internet until I get my prototype done, because once I'm done, once my prototype is done, and I have my manufacturing strategies, my manufacturing tooling set up, It'll be harder for someone to beat me. It, it, it becomes a race at that point. They'll have to, if it's a big company, yeah, they can beat me pretty quickly, but I don't. Well, I, I wish you good luck. So. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a super good answer to that question, but I have thought of it. So, yes? Uh, your bearings, did you get them from SKF or whether? Okay, so all the bearings are, they're Chinese bearings, but they're essentially. Their copies of SKF or Tenkin. I've, I've had hit and miss um, results with Chinese bearings, and I just I found a supplier that provided pretty very good bearings. But I've had some bearings undersized, oversized, or Chinese. I would like to use SKF or Tenkin. It just depends on cost. Yeah. So yeah, good question. Yeah, you didn't mention anything about your braking system. You have a braking system. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, so uh, it's a simple disc brake system. Um, Hand operated, foot operated. Yeah, hand operated. There's there's a lever on here. here I'm it, I'm assuming. I kind of went over that quickly because I we were having some issues running out of time, but um, so here's the lever here, and here's the brake rotor and the caliper. Um, so it's just one. It, it's on the drive axle. So even though there's only one rotor. It's essentially breaking two wheels. So it's a hand operated. Hand operated. It's very. If you come out and see it out there, you can pull it, and it's very easy. So it's mechanical. It's just it's mechanical operated. It's just hydraulic? hand operated hydraulic, just like okay. your car. Okay. Or, or your motorcycle. And then how about um, getting this onto a rail? You said weight three hundred pounds. About four hundred pounds. Four hundred pounds. So you need multiple. <coughs> two people could do it. You pick one end up and you pivot it. You can pivot it around. And, I mean, we, we brought it into the atrium at Building 17. And it yeah, it's different from atrium than down And then the on road. the track, so when yeah. you go on a track, you, you tend to, you want to find where the where a road goes over the track. So you can just, so maybe you can just drive it right up and then okay. let it bring it. And the third question I have is that on the on the ratings um, system in, just say, California, do you need special permits to even operate this on the rail system? Yes, yeah, so most of the tracks are in here owned by Union Pacific or you know BNSF, you know the big rail cut companies. So they're not going to let you on their track unless you know like the executive or something. Okay. So um, where we plan, where I plan to start my business is a is a not really an abandoned track, but it's it's owned by by a government agency. And if it's owned by a government agency, sometimes you could gain permission. Um, museums, there's I I usually go to a museum where they have thirty miles of track. And I get to use their track. They run their trains, and we coordinate. So, but you can't just put it on any track. <laughs> okay, so I guess that would not limit your uh, business strategy if you're limited so, to only those options. Yes. Yeah, so, so my customer here is not really individuals. It's going to be businesses starting up these rail, these rail bike operations. So, amusement parks, for example. Let's say Knott's Berry Farm. You know, mm -hmm. they could purchase 20 of these, and they could run them on their tracks. And it's arrived at that point. So yeah, these businesses are, are what these are going to be marketed to, um, because a business may buy they may buy forty vehicles. Okay. Because um, you have to make profit, and to make profit, the more vehicles you have, the more profit you can make. Okay. So that, that that's the market. They're not for hobbyists. I mean, these are going to cost fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. So it's not something. So you're going to focus more on private uh, businesses. And businesses, not just yeah. Somebody who just wants to buy it. Yeah, I get those calls all the, all day long. And, most of them don't understand what it costs to build one of these devices. So, yes. You mentioned you had an issue with deflection and then you fixed it. Can you explain that part? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, 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 I'd love to explain this stuff in more depth. It's just, I don't have to be given two hours. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so the original frame, okay, so this is the current frame design. You can see we have, bot we have a structure, bottom structure and top structure and it's connected together. There's bracing over here. Um, so, so, so yeah, that, that's the current design, which has 18, about 18,000 of the deflection. That's including the reaction forces from the, uh, 
lever arm and all that. So that's a maximum force. So we're talking about probably just a few thousands under normal operating conditions. So going up, I used to have a picture of what it used to look like. Unfortunately, I snipped it out of here because I said, I don't, that's a bad design, I don't want it in here. But anyways, sorry about that. Anyways, the old design did not have a beam. The beam running between this seat and this seat was non-existent. It's about this long. So that, that transfers all the uh, stress to the bottom beams. And deflection was high, and also there's a lot of holes in the frame, so stress concentrations induced by the, um, the various components bolted to it were also a concern. So uh, that's why I added the upper beam. And the, re the reason for not having the upper beam was so pat people could be more comfortable because you're straddling this thing, but that turned out not to be an issue. So, and deflection is, the main, is a driving um, structural uh, concern here not stress, at least on this current frame. Stresses are nothing, they're, they're very little. I mean, I mean uh, fatigue stresses, if I was to, you know, I haven't analyzed every single hole in the car, um, but that would definitely probably show higher stresses than what the FEA is showing because there's no stress concentrations really used by holes or bolts or anything on this model. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that you that one of your requirements is being able to go in reverse without having to get it off your seat. How is that? What is that mechanism? How do you go in reverse? Okay, so reverse is as simple as stop. When the vehicle's at rest, you just choose to push or to pull, and that first motion will determine the direction you go. So it wasn't the mechanism that that was a concern. It was more the scene arrangement. So that if you're going backwards, you can't have that's why the seats face each other. So when you're going one way, you have two people looking forward, and when you go the other way, you have two people going backwards. If everyone faces the same direction, you have everyone will have to turn around to come back, and that's wasted time, you know, which equals wasted money as far as a business standpoint. And the mechanism had to be designed around that so that you're facing each other. So, so it's just like that, that, really that, that's what yeah, the actual mechanism, that, that's a no-brainer. All crank mechanisms can be reversed by just changing the initial um, direction you start, the initial force that you acti that activates that handle. Oh yes? Maybe just a future tip, you can add like a rotating mechanism to the base of the seat and then have that rotate if it like, works with the space that you have. Like spin around? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's, um, it's more that then you have to make the mechanism also yeah, because your feet your feet are on these pedals and your yeah. arms are on these handles. So, it there if you go look at the car, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts on there, and it's it's definitely a challenge to get where everyone's comfortable and you know that's the big challenge at this point. Just getting this so anyone could jump on it in two minutes and be going up down the track. That's you know, that's a design challenge at this point, which I think is going to be okay. <laughs> Yeah, so when there are four people on it, the thing doesn't hit the other person in the face, right? No, the, the, the arm, the lever arm, as long as your seats are adjusted right, which um, one of the design changes is going to be to redesign the seats so they're, they're not adjustable. They're currently adjustable, which is great, but if you forget to adjust them, a tall person or a shorter person or any size person can get hurt because that handle can come and hit you. So, Design change is going to be some sort of um, a non-adjustable seat that allows people to be uh, seated properly on, on the seat, which is a, another device which is out of the scope of the presentation. But um, yeah, that is that, that that is definitely. I've thought of almost probably everything, and a lot of these questions you bring up are great questions because I've pondered them for sometimes weeks, months. Years. <laughs> yeah. A question for like the uh, parts. Let's say that was like five these, and I'm assuming there'd be multiple cars on the same track. Yes. Uh, if you look into like a, a peer to peer talking for the cart, so if some kids forget to brake, and then they're gonna go to the next cart. Um, yeah. They'll, like sense each other and just start braking. Um, automatically. Like automatically. Yeah. <laughs> if they forget to like. You know, an amusement park that would be actually actually amusement park regulations require automatic braking. But there are exemptions for hand-powered vehicles that we are working on with the agencies to 
to kind of, it's a gray zone. This is, but, but yes, automatic ranking is not really feasible, probably. Just because then you have to have sensors in the track, and we're going to be running on tracks that are where the trains used to run on. So the trains won't be running on them any longer, but there'll still be old, and it'll be a lot of capital to invest in sensing devices to do that. But you got to a point for an amusement park like Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm that would be that would probably be more important. But braking, the vehicle stops. The brake will stop it very quickly, and if um, I don't see a catastrophic accident happening because happening you're going so slow in this For your wheel, you said you formed them with the die. Did you machine that die, or is that something you got? Yes, the die was machined. It weighs about 1,000 pounds, solid steel. And it was it was machined for, 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 my, for the regular hand cars that, that my business produces. This is a prototype. So this is not quite into you know, this is not into production yet, but it uses this, essentially the same wheel. So I had that die that I manufactured several years, years ago. And, the, the metal is using hydraulics. It is forced around this die as it's rotating to form that, that steel tire. So we're working on actually improving the tooling now, a much better tooling and much better manufacturing process. Because the manufacturing is one thing. The design is one thing. The manufacturing is a separate thing. If you can't manufacture it, then we're supporting your design. So that's, that, that's what I'm going into now is the manufacturing. OK, one last question. Yes. Okay. For those uh, for those steel tires, do you resurface them in any way to improve the I guess the surface finish for a smooth ride, or are they already smooth enough uh, coming out? Of the they're factory? they're pretty smooth. I mean, okay. the the current manufacturing process has a lot of variation in it. So some of them have roller marks from when the hydraulic motors come in. Uh, the future ones are going to be all CNC formed. So um, they're probably going to be very nice. And the tracks we're running on are not the smoothest. So I haven't seen much correlation between surface finish of the tire and the ride quality. So yeah, good question. Anyone else has any more questions? I'll be outside the 17 atrium for a little bit longer. So yes, we, uh, we had a prolonged you know, presentation. But thank you for the interesting.